Hello everyone, this is Deborah Richardson and today I am putting the AP in Happy where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. This podcast will give a voice to accounts payable team members by talking about the growing reality of cyber attacks in their world and which vendor setup and vendor management techniques they can apply to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Need training? Visit the Vendor Process Training Center to enroll in your choice of weekly live and on-demand training sessions. Plus, get access to Vendor Setup form templates and reference tools that will help you and your team avoid fraud, fines, and bad vendor data. So sign up for a free account to get access to free training sessions, Vendor Process, FAQs, and a resource library with information you need to manage your vendor master file. Visit training.deborahrichardson.com today. The link will be in the show notes. I recently spoke at an in-person conference, and while there, I attended a session where an accounts payable practitioner revealed what they are doing when making the confirmation call and what they were doing surprised not only the other attendees, but also me. Plus, I want to talk about what another attendee of that same session revealed that might make that step useless. Keep listening. Welcome to episode 290. One step you are probably not doing with the confirmation phone call but here are reasons it might not work for you. So I love going to in-person conferences. I'm uh, glad that everything, at least as far as I can see, is getting back to normal for attending conferences. The attendance is up and maybe even improved. And it's a great place to just engage with colleagues, engage with those folks that might have the same pain points as you do. And so that's where I was uh, for the past four days. And so I want to talk about one specific session that I attended and what exactly happened. And so I attended this conference and I attended as a speaker, but I don't speak the entire time. I had four sessions uh, throughout the uh, three-day conference. And so I had some time to uh, visit other sessions. And so I went to one and it was about uh, how to avoid fraud, like a, a fraud prevention program. And so I'm always, you know, into what other people are, are suggesting to avoid fraud. And so I attended it. And One of the things that came out of that is one practitioner indicated, uh, because the question was, what else is anyone else doing, right, to avoid fraud? And this one practitioner raised her hand and said that they are recording that confirmation call. So not sure if you guys have ever heard of that um, or have ever done that. I will tell you, I've never done that as a practitioner and I have never heard of anyone else doing it. And just to clarify here, I'm sure you all know, but that confirmation call is when typically done when you get a change of remittance information. Most people do it for banking. I say you should do it for banking uh, detail changes and for remittance address changes if your vendor's payment method is by check because, you know, fraudsters are targeting both. But in any event, uh, the common remedy to avoid fraud is to do that confirmation call. I, however, think you need to surround it with uh, controls, best practices, authentication techniques, and other validations uh, to make it stronger. But The confirmation call, right, wasn't surprising, but it was surprising uh, that it was recorded. And so 
there was quite a bit of buzz in the room when that uh, was said. And one person, I think, asked if they had consent from the other person to record. And I don't remember if they asked for consent or if she only said that they let them know that they were being recorded. And so not sure which that was because I could only hear the part where she said they let the other party know that the call was being re, uh, recorded. And so that was one. And the next question was, was it legal to do that? And the person did respond that for them, it was legal, but she didn't say why or, you know, is it because in their state it's legal or I don't know, their attorneys researched it and said it was okay. We didn't get that type of uh, response, but she did indicate that uh, for their company, uh, they were not breaking any laws. Now, I will tell you when I was a practitioner, we also tried to record the phone calls of our team members, but the purpose of that was is to make sure that they were doing the authentication piece where they were asking two to three identifying questions. And this was all of the folks that uh, took questions or inquiries from vendors and then also from internal employees from the payroll side. And we didn't get that far to do the research based on the state or any other uh, criteria because the software that we used or that we had to record the audio also recorded the screens. And so the screens, especially in payroll, could have sensitive uh, information on them. And so for that reason, we did not pursue to verify whether or not that was something that we could do legally. We were just trying to figure out if we could do it, period, based on the software platform that our phone systems ran on. So we didn't even get that far. So hopefully that person's uh, company or legal team did and they are okay with what they are doing, meaning letting the other party know that they are recording and recording that confirmation call. Now, I get why they want to do it, right? Because they have a record of the confirmation. Uh, they can ensure the confirmation confirmation was done. And you know, you never know if it's really being done or really being done correctly. Uh, if you are not yourself performing those confirmation calls. So this is a great way to do uh, an audit and make sure that everyone is following the processes that are in place for that confirmation call and maybe even a script, which is what I recommend that you have for all of your team members to make sure that they are not giving away information, that they're authenticating within the script. So I think it's a great Great idea if it is uh, can be done by your company and you're not breaking any laws and your leadership is aware and has approved. So I like it for that reason. Also, it's just added documentation or added record that can be reviewed to catch red flags before the payment goes out of the door. So one of the controls that I always talk about is if you've had a vendor that has had a recent remittance change and has like a large payment that's about to go out, because you know, cyber criminals will wait until those large payments are due and then submit the change request. And so if you have a report that you can pull once the pay file let's say for ACH payment once it's run, but before you send it to the bank, run a report uh, and uh, pull and review all of those payments that are over a certain amount. You can pick what that is and that have also had recent remittance changes, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then have someone review the process and all the documents collected, all the things that were done, that's a part of your process. Have someone review that it was done and that there isn't anything suspicious. It's the second set of eyes before 
before it goes out of the door. And so having this recording is another uh, piece of documentation that uh, the uh, reviewer can look at to identify if there should be any suspicions with that change. Now, the last thing, uh, and I'm not quite sure if this would be a deterrence or not, but I think it might be a deterrence for fraudsters. If you call them and tell them that you are recording this confirmation call, maybe that is a deterrence because now you have recorded the phone number that you have reached the fraudster or cyber criminal at. And so maybe that will be a deterrence. I'm not quite sure about the voice because they have, you know, AI tools out there that they could change your voice, but I guess it's the phone number that might make them apprehensive. So it could be a deterrence for frosters. Okay, so that company is doing it, but can your company do it? Just like with vendor validations, every company uh, is unique and may have different requirements, uh, different restrictions. And so let's talk about why recording confirmation calls may not work, um, things that you definitely need to check. So the first thing is, is that the system that's used to record the audio may also record your screen. And I talked about earlier how that was an issue uh, for us. Now you may be able to get a separate uh, phone call or um, call recording system, or maybe your system does not include the recording of the actual screen. The second one is, is that your state may not allow recorded phone calls. And that could be true. You do need to do some research or your legal team needs to do some research. Maybe your state does allow them as long as the person consents to them, maybe uh, to the recording, consents to the recording, or maybe your state will allow it as long as you let them know, notify them that they're being recorded. Uh, and so that does need to be researched. And then maybe your company or your leadership, right, for whatever reason, may not allow recorded phone calls. So you definitely need to check. So those are three reasons why it might not work. Now, I have a last one, a fourth one, and this one is actually big because this is what the other or another attendee of the same session said that might make that step just really useless. And it's the fact that there was an AR team member in the uh, audience and they said they have been instructed by their leaders not to even confirm their banking over the phone. And if you think about it, it does kind of make sense. I get it. The vendors want to be paid, but if you have these larger companies and you have like random people calling, and yes, you may think you're not random, but you are random, uh, people calling them or getting these calls in to confirm their banking information, they have no idea who you are. So what really needs to happen is you need to provide write that information uh, for them to make uh, to let them know that you are right doing business with them. And those are the type of things you, that you want to include in your script, like I was talking about before. And typically you would say something like, hi, my name is uh, whatever your name is. I am from uh, whatever your company's name is. I am calling on behalf of, and that would be the person that um, your point of contact uh, at the vendor's company has a relationship with. And if that is a larger company, you may have to give that point of contact's name as well, because at least now you are providing some information that, uh, that indicates that your company may be doing business with them. Now they may, they may have to get off the phone and validate that uh, authenticate that information with that point of contact, but at least it's providing more information than just calling them and asking, telling them you had a bank change and asking them to confirm the, the bank change request. So again, there are vendors out there that have uh, instructed their um, team members to not confirm banking. And so you can record that 
but it's really not going to do you any good. You need to have another process in place to make sure that you are not paying a cyber criminal when you're supposed to be paying your vendor. And if you've listened to my podcast for a while, you know that I always talk about authentication techniques, internal controls, best practices, and vendor validations, uh, especially to surround that confirmation call if it can't be done, including that control I just talked about earlier of having a second set of eyes on a report uh, pulled after the pay cycle, let's say for ACH has been run, but before it's been sent to the bank and having another set of eyes review that process to update the banking details and just verify that the process to change the banking match the process that you require. And there were no red flags that might have been missed. All right. So I hope you found this interesting because I certainly did. Every time I go to an in-person conference, I always find out something new. I love engaging with practitioners that are out in the field that are dealing with this fraud on a daily basis. And so hopefully you got some value out of this of either what to do or what you may need to research in order to implement. All right. So thanks everyone. I hope you enjoy the 290th episode of the Putting the AP in Happy podcast, where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Don't forget to check the show notes for the links mentioned in the podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing and writing a review of my podcast on the platform that you use to listen. Stay happy. Stay happy.